All right, we're talking today about oxygenating and monitoring the neonate. So with um, the first slide, it talks about hypoxemia. It asks you a question, what is a normal PaO2 and SpO2 in the neonate breathing room air? So oxygen level is a little bit lower than adult oxygenation. It's 50 to 80 tor or millimeters mercury in the neonate. So normal PaO2, 50 to 80 millimeters mercury or tor. And that will give a saturation, an SpO2, of 88 to 95 percent. So hypoxemia will be below that. Hypoxemia occurs at less than 85% SpO2. And at that point, you'll want to give supplemental oxygen to the neonate. If you already have them on oxygen, then you want to keep the saturation between 85 and 90%. Um, it, it says between 85 and 90 percent, but that's for infants less than 34 weeks. And then infants greater than 34 weeks, the 88 to 95. One thing to keep in mind is that when um, prior to birth, the fetal PaO2 is about 30 millimeters of mercury. So their entire body is developing with that uh, kind of an oxygen saturation of about 75%. Um, so once they're born, we don't need to target a 90% sat in neonates because um, they don't need that much oxygen for that developmental stage that they're in. Um, with, high, with pediatric patients, that looks a little bit more like adults, where you, um, you place them on oxygen if the PaO2 is less than 60 and their saturation is less than 90. All right, when looking at somebody whose oxygen level is low, they will have a bluish appearance if five grams of hemoglobin are not attached to oxygen. So in arterial blood, if you have a normal hemoglobin content is, what, 15 grams per deciliter? When five grams of that hemoglobin does not have oxygen, then you'll appear cyanotic. So cyanosis appears when the hemoglobin, when five grams of hemoglobin, they're not carrying oxygen. <coughs> um, peripheral cyanosis only indicates decreased perfusion. Um, peripheral cyanosis, when you have pink mucosa, um, that's considered your, your actual arterial oxygen level. Um, and then blue extremities just mean you don't have good blood flow going to the fingers or to the toes. So if you see cyanosis in the hands and the legs, you can't say the saturation is low or that they're hypoxemic. You have to look at the, the mucous membranes to determine whether they have cyanosis or not. Um, so it says the lips, the tongue, and mucous membranes will appear cyanotic. Mild to moderate hypoxemia is usually accompanied with respiratory distress. So if you're using the... Um, Silverman Anderson score on a neonate and you're looking at how they're breathing, um, that's how you would come up with that Silverman Anderson scoring for respiratory distress. Um, you would see 
nasal flaring, intercostal retractions, expiratory grunting, paradoxical chest movement. Um, so those are all signs of respiratory distress in the neonate. If they have severe hypoxemia, they respond differently than adults where um, low oxygen saturation will cause the heart rate to fall. With adults, we get um, tachycardic with hypoxemia. Neonates become bradycardic with hypoxemia. And it also induces apnea. All right, so if we have a neonate that is hypoxemic and we need to add supplemental oxygen, what are our choices for adding oxygen? So we'll go through that next. And then you have to remember with neonates, especially those that are born prematurely, you always have to measure oxygen saturation. Um, reason for that is if we're giving a high enough saturation, it could mean that the PaO2 is high in arterial blood. And when you have a high PaO2, it's going to affect the um, vascularization of the eyes. And, cause, and it can lead to blindness, retinal detachment. Um, so you always monitor with a pulse oximeter. <coughs> um, the oxyhood is not being used much. Um, typically now, we're going from um, the hypoxemia being treated with nasal CPAP first. So instead of going in stages where, okay, they're hypoxemic, Let's put them on an oxyhood. Oh look, we're already up to 50% FiO2 on the oxyhood. Let's try some nasal CPAP. Now instead of going through the oxyhood to nasal CPAP, nasal, P nasal CPAP is implemented right away. So hopefully the when you take your national exam, it's updated there, but just in case it isn't, just to let you know, I mean you see a picture of an oxyhood, I think you're still you used it last year in your equipment lab? Did you play with an oxyhood last year? No. no. Um, so there's questions on the national exam about measuring the FiO2 inside the hood. Well, when you're measuring um, oxygen concentration, you've got this big opening. So you've got room air coming in, so you have to have an adequate flow of gas um, to flush the inside of the hood with the oxygen supply. Um, so you need like 10 liters a minute or more of warmed gas going through the hood. Um, and then when you analyze it, you want to analyze it over, um, away from the opening. Those are the types of questions that used to be asked. I don't know if it still will be. Another picture of an oxy hood showing a temperature gauge so you can keep track of the temperature inside the hood. Um, this is for putting the oxygen analyzer in there to analyze the amount of oxygen that you're delivering to the baby. All right, so next we talk about devices that you would deliver oxygen with a nasal cannula. The first one it talks about is just hooking up a nasal cannula to a pediatric flow meter and humidifier. And in your notes, write down that this is done usually when they have to go home on oxygen. This is the type of oxygen that's delivered in the home setting, in the home care setting. Um, they might need a quarter of a liter of oxygen via nasal cannula, um, sometimes an eighth of a liter of oxygen. And that's enough to keep their O2 stats in range until their lungs develop a little bit more. And then once their lungs develop a little bit more, they don't need the oxygen. Um, but if they're going home on oxygen, it would be a nasal cannula and an oxygen concentrator. Um, so with um, one liter per minute of flow provides about 60% concentration of oxygen. Why not? 24% like it is on an adult. Like when we put a nasal cannula on an adult and we turn the flow meter on to about one liter per minute, we say that an adult is getting about 24% FiO2. When we put one liter per minute on an infant, we say we're getting about 60% FiO2. Why do you think that is? 
Is it because of the percentage of inheritance that's uh, occluded? Um, occlusion of an heir? No. Body surface area? The body surface area is smaller. Therefore, what else is smaller? Their lungs are smaller. So the amount of room air that they entrain with that uh, one liter is very little. So that one liter of flow is providing them with pretty much their entire tidal volume. And that's why their FIO, the delivered FIO2 is pretty high, about 60%. <coughs> um, with an adult, we breathe in about 500 ml, so we dilute that one liter of flow a lot. Um, and once it's diluted, it, you get about 24% of FIO2. But with an infant not diluting it, they're getting a much higher percentage with one liter. All right, the next one you can cross off. It says hooked to a blender and humidifier. Um, pretty much Vapotherm is taking over babies that are on a nasal cannula with um, a humidifier, and then you just use a low FiO2, maybe 22%, 23%, but then you crank up the flow to deliver a little bit of extra pressure, wash out that anatomic dead space. Now that's being done with units like Vapotherm, instead of just um, do it using a blender, a humidifier, and a cannula the old-fashioned way. Um, so this one, the hook to a blender and humidifier, you can cross that one off. All right, another way that hypoxemia is treated is with CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. Um, so it, when you deliver a positive air, airway pressure and you keep that in the lungs at all times, um, it'll increase the FRC. Does it mention that on here? No. So we're increasing FRC. And when you have an increase in FRC, you have more air in the alveoli and better gas exchange and oxygenation improves. Um, it says that it reduces ventilation perfusion mismatch, again, because you're keeping the alveoli open. Um, it's preventing terminal airway closure, so that positive pressure is preventing atelectasis. And it will recruit collapsed alveoli. Um, so CPAP, it says, is used as a bridge between oxygen therapy and mechanical ventilation. Um, we have to update our notes. Pretty much it's um, CPAP, if that doesn't work, then we go to mechanical ventilation. So it's birth, hypoxemia, CPAP, failure, mechanical ventilation. So it goes to birth, if hypoxemia, nasal CPAP. If that fails, then mechanical ventilation. So birth, if hypoxemia, then nasal CPAP. Nasal CPAP fails, then mechanical ventilation, or intubation and mechanical ventilation. There's different ways of delivering nasal CPAP, and the um, demonstration that we had from Tony on Vapotherm is that the nasal cannula only occupies about 50% of the opening of the nares. Um, so with nasal CPAP, we don't want 50% of the opening. We want the prongs to fit comfortably in the nares, but to occlude the nares so that a positive pressure can be generated. So that's the difference between a high flow nasal cannula and creating nasal CPAP, is you want the prongs to fit snugly in the nares, and that way you'll create a positive pressure. And it can be delivered uh, with different machines. You can have nasal CPAP running on the ventilator where you set your positive pressure, you set your FiO2. Um, sometimes a backup rate is set. I think I was telling you about that. If you, if you see nasal CPAP and you see the ventilator next to the baby with a rate, 
It's typically used to um, send a puff of air into the oropharynx. It stimulates babies that have frequent episodes of apnea. Um, there's a machine that delivers uh, CPAP, and it's called PsiPAP machine, where on exhalation, it measures whether the baby's breathing in or breathing out. When the infant exhales, it slows the flow down a little bit so that they can exhale, and then picks it back up again during inspiration. So in order to do that, it's got to respond pretty quick. Can you imagine a respiratory rate of 40 to 60 times a minute? You've got to slow that flow down and then ramp it back up to deliver the pressure and inspiration. So um, I don't see it used. It was being used at Broward Health. Is anybody doing neonatal rotation in Broward Health? Ledger? Yeah, Do you see any CPAP machines at the bedside? No, mostly bubble CPAP. It's mostly bubble CPAP? Okay. All right, the next one listed is bubble CPAP. Um, and we have slides on the different ones. Right, so nasal CPAP is indicated for mild to moderate respiratory distress on room air. It requires the flow of five to six liters per minute. And for larger infants, you'll need more flow. So the smaller the infant, the less their minute ventilation, the less flow you need. But as the babies are bigger, then you increase the flow to up to like 10 liters a minute. Um, exhaling against a positive pressure creates a positive pressure in the lungs. Um, it says for starting pressures, four to six centimeters of water pressure. Most commonly now, they're starting with five centimeters of water. Um, so most common starting point now is five centimeters of water. You can go up to eight centimeters of water with CPAP. When you go beyond that though, it becomes too much flow. The infant can't exhale against that high flow and they start retaining CO2 in their lungs and then CO2 in their blood. So flows higher than eight centimeter of water are not good because it, it um, prevents an adequate exhalation. So greater than eight centimeters of water prevents an adequate exhalation. Raj, you have a question? Yeah. For, um, for neonates, do they only use the, the nasal pumps or do they use the, the mask, the nasal mask? Both. They'll use the mask. The mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't seen the mask used at Joe DiMaggio, but I see it used at Broward. No, because we saw it, but it was in take you they, they tried a mask, a nasal mask on the patient. Oh, really? Yeah. So oh, I, didn't, okay. I didn't know if they just reserved that for, like, pediatric older children. It started out with the preemies. Oh. So it seems like everything starts with the babies, and then it makes its way to the adult world. Um, but, yeah, just having a mask over the nose, no, I guess that started with adults. I take it back. All right, with bubble CPAP, it combines the effects of the positive pressure, so continuous positive airway pressure, but then there's also pressure oscillations from the bubbles. So as water is exiting through, I didn't say that right, did that? The exhaled gas exits through water, and when it does, of course, you've got air inside liquid and bubbles form, and it bubbles up to the surface, and that's how exhalation occurs. Um, but it's that bubbling, it creates some oscillations. You can feel it when you're holding the circuit. Those same oscillations are also present in the neonate's lungs. Um, I don't know how many studies have proven that it, it's effective, uh, but the claims are that those oscillations in the airway reduce work of breathing and improve oxygenation. Um, one thing about bubble CPAP, it's very inexpensive. You don't need expensive equipment to deliver nasal CPAP. And it, um, the studies that have been done show that it, it has the same efficacy as using CPAP or the ventilator. Um, so when something is inexpensive and it works, it's typically the most commonly used item. So you see it quite a bit.
Um, this shows the bubble CPAP system from Fisher Paykel, or Paykel is the proper way to pronounce it. Um, so you have an oxygen source or a, a blended gas source. I see the blender in the background. And the air, the dry air, goes to the humidifier. And on the humidifier is a device that if there's high pressure that builds up in this system, um, the pressure will exit through this pressure pop-off. About 17 centimeters of water is um, the point at which air will leak through this. Um, so the flow of gas goes through the humidifier, picks up the heat, the moisture, and then it's delivered through the circuit to the neonate's nasal prongs. On exhalation, um, the exhaled air flows uh, into this device that has water and then a column of water where the exhalation has to go through. And they typically put vinegar in here. Even though the flow is going one way and this water bath would never come in contact with the neonate, just to be safe, they want to keep this yeah, it's not really sterile, but bacteriostatic, I guess. Prevent bacteria from growing, so they put vinegar in there. Professor? Yes. I did ask Kim about that, and she said Brower uses sterile water, and Joe DiMaggio uses the vinegar. So they use different things, and the studies show that it really doesn't matter, but those hospitals do use two different. Oh, do they? Yeah. It's good to know. <laughs> Isn't that amazing how two hospitals so close together and do things so differently? All right, so with a high flow nasal cannula, it's a little bit different delivery device. You're, you're not occluding the nares. Um, your goal is you're creating some positive pressure, but there's no way of measuring that positive pressure. So you really don't know if you're getting any positive pressure in the airways. But oxygenation improves more so than it does just on a standard nasal cannula. So we can surmise that we've got some positive pressure going on. We just can't measure it. So that's the difference between nasal CPAP and a high flow nasal cannula. With nasal CPAP, we are delivering a positive pressure. We are measuring that pressure. Um, high flow cannula, we're getting some positive pressure, but it's not measured. Matter of fact, I noticed during the presentation, that's not even, um, I guess they're not allowed to mention that. Um, we're creating a positive pressure because you can't measure it. So they don't mention it at all. And we also know that high flow nasal cannula will um, wash out anatomic dead space. I don't see that written on your slide. Do you want to write it in? So we're improving FRC and oxygenation with some positive pressure, um, but we're also washing anatomic dead space out, which gets rid of CO2. So wash out anatomic dead space and you're washing out um, exhaled gas with CO2 in it. And we had some discussion this morning about why you have to heat the gas to body temperature. And when you're blowing a, a, a fast flow of gas into the nose, it can dry out the mucosa and become uncomfortable. Um, so it's there's less side effects if you heat the gas to room temp to body temperature and deliver it at body temperature. So to deliver it at 37 degrees, um, it's supposedly more comfortable. And Alyssa had the um, high flow oxygen on last week and you felt that the extra warmth didn't feel good? You raised it to body temperature. Yeah. You didn't like that? <laughs> All right, so one type of high flow nasal cannula is 
put out by Vapor Therm. Um, we get to work with it in the lab now. We don't have to just visit it on the website. For the next four slides, identify the type of device being used. Is it a high-flow nasal cannula? Is it nasal CPAP with nasal prongs? Or is it nasal CPAP with a mask? So here we've got the first picture. Nasal CPAP with prongs. Yes, very good. Nasal CPAP with prongs. This is what's used at Joe DiMaggio. Difference between those? Between what? Because uh, he said they use that at Joseph Archer, and I remember those. But at Broward, they don't use those. So is there a difference between using? Yeah, there's different, um, they call them interfaces. Mm -hmm. This has the, the bar going across the nose. Because that just seems so much more uncomfortable than the one that Broward uses, which is kind of like the one down. Um, this one? Yeah. And to me, because having that on such a small baby, it just seems so... Because my kids were preemies, and they had that when they were born. And I always said that. And then when I went to Broward, I see these. And the therapists also tell me they like those because it's not as comfortable. You can also put the babies, you know, on their on prone position because some babies freak better like that. And I just... Yeah, this isn't going to create the same positive pressure because the cannula or the um, prongs are smaller than the nose. So you're not going to get nasal CPAP with this. It's mm, a difference. Yeah. That's just a high flow. Yes, this is just a high flow nasal cannula. Yeah. So is that what you're seeing at Broward, or do you see this with the nasal like CPAP? That, but it's similar to that. It's more. It's a lot smaller, and it's a nasal CPAP. It's just similar to. Oh, that. I see. But it, it doesn't have that bulkiness that the other one had. Does it look more like this? No, that looks. It very looks like a regular. Um, it looks like a regular nasal CPAP, just without those things on the side. I'll pull out what I have in the back, maybe you yeah. can show. Okay. All right, so what do you think about this picture at the top? <coughs> nasal CPAP <coughs> with nasal prongs. Yes, nasal CPAP. Um, this one, it's hard to see. Is that a mask? But it looks like it could be a mask yeah, covering the nose. Sure. So nasal it's, CPAP with mask. That, for me, looks very uncomfortable. Having a mask? Yeah. Really? It just seems like... And then the last one? High flow nasal cannula? Yes. Well, the second one is a mask. Oh, yeah, now we yeah. can see the mask. The top one is that a ram cannula? Yes. This is so cute. So, ram cannula would be a high flow? Yes. Hook up the ramp handlers to the vent. Mm -hmm. So, like, what is that? To the ventilator? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the benefit of that? Um, so, when it was hooked up to the ventilator, did you, were you able to tell if a positive pressure was being generated? I think they had it on CPAP, right? Mm. I can't remember what it said. They had it on. Wow, okay. The ram cannula for delivering nasal CPAP? Mm -hmm. When they put it to the vent, I guess, instead of like um, a BIPOC or anything, they did that instead. Or that one kid's emergency, yeah. after they bag him, he's like, okay, hook him up to the vent with the uh, ram. Okay. So, um, did you get to see how he selected the size? Like, what was the goal? To get something that fits inside the nares, or is 50% of the size of the nares? So maybe you can ask the therapist when you're with them? Um, how do they choose the size for the ram cannula? 
I mean, is the goal to occlude as much of the nose as possible, or is the goal to leave some space around it for exhalation? And if you do that, are you still able to maintain your pressures if you have a big opening in the nose? I wouldn't think so. That's what I'll ask. Okay. To be continued. Yeah, these pictures are kind of hard to tell. Does this look like a mask or prongs? It looks like a mask. They look like both masks. Yeah, they're so far away. And this is the CPAP machine to deliver um, CPAP. All right, and then monitoring oxygen. start off with drawing an arterial blood gas. If they have a catheter placed inside the umbilical artery, we can get, yeah, that's going to be arterial blood coming from the femoral artery. I don't know why it's showing blue. Um, so if one of these are catheterized, then we can just draw arterial blood right from the umbilical artery. This is used for monitoring blood pressure and also for administering fluids and blood products. And you can, if a baby is born doing well and then they deteriorate, they can still access the umbilical artery up to two days after birth, but by then it starts to close off, or after that it starts to close off. Um, drawing a right radial arterial blood gas on a preemie, on a neonate, Therapist will show you how to do it. It's very hard to hit a little teeny tiny artery. Sometimes they use a Doppler um, so they can hear where the blood vessel is because they're not they can't palpate it. All right, with the artery that goes into the catheter, heparin has to be continuously infused so the line stays patent. And you don't get blood clots. Um, when they put the catheter in and they thread it in, it can't be placed too far in because then it'll stop the um, arteries that leave the aorta and go over to the kidneys. It would include those. Um, so once they get the catheter in, they usually get an x-ray, an abdominal x-ray, to see where the placement of the catheter is. All right, so normal capillary blood gases. I have some notes here. Places to draw arterial blood from creamies and newborns can include the temporal artery, <coughs> temporal, temporal artery in the head. Also consider dorsalis pedis. So that's 